while we were on the run, a married elder with three children whom he worked with came and met us and gave him money to keep us on the run while my mother was frantically um, looking for me. All right. Well, we today are going to talk to Nancy. She is a former Jehovah's Witness. And Nancy and I got acquainted recently, and Nancy has quite a story. So, Nancy, I'm going to give the floor to you. But where I'd love to start is if you can tell me uh, how long you were a Jehovah's Witness and how you got in, okay? Thank you, Elaine, for this opportunity to be able to tell my story. Um, I've been associated with this organization since 1986. I was baptized in May. Um, I came in contact with this organization through my parents when I was 11 years old. They decided, decided to study, and that's when I was acquainted. First acquainted. Okay. All right. And um, so why did your parents decide to study? What was missing in their lives that they felt that they needed to entertain the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, my mom was a non-practicing Catholic and she was agnostic at the time. And my mother was very curious about the occult. And she was reading many books on it and was just about to start putting curses on my stepfather. Their relationship was not good. And I remember her telling me that she actually uh, saw that there was an evil side by reading these books. And she concluded if there was an evil side, there must be a good side. So she, she told me she said a sincere prayer to God and asked him if he was there, that he would reveal himself to her and that she would serve him. And then there they were, Jehovah's Witnesses at our door. Wow. So... I have a question for you. So your mother was looking into the occult and then she prayed to God to reveal himself and she got associated with the Jehovah's Witness organization. How interesting to make the connection of the two. I actually spoke to her about that and I, I, I said to her, do you think you connect it with the wrong side? You know, she didn't know what to say. But um, yeah, she felt this was a sign from God. Mm -hmm. and, and so her and my stepfather started studying. And um, they were then baptized in 1986 in Tucson, Arizona. So we had left Tucson, Arizona because my stepdad couldn't take the, the climate there. So we moved back to Pennsylvania, our home state, in 1978. And I was 14 years old at this time. And um, at this point, um, our family life Two years into this religion, their marriage was horrible. There was constant fighting, violence, and abuse in the family. And it was clear that my stepfather at this time, he was living a double life, and he did not want to be part of this newfound religion anymore. And this caused a lot of upset between, you know, my, my parents and all of us. So my mom would take us to the meetings alone, and she, she loved to help others and frequently provided hospitality to all the friends, and they were because they were all Jehovah's friends, and she could trust all of them. But then on this one snowy evening, she, um, she had people over, and they were all leaving, but she invited this one young 21-year-old baptized brother to stay over because the roads were bad, because she felt sorry for him. He came from a very bad upbringing, bad family. And it was on that night that this brother, he came into my room while I was sleeping with my five-year-old sister and led me into the living room where he proceeded to sexually assault me. Afterwards, he continued to try to convince me to leave my home, um, had me skipping school, picking me up, and then finally convincing me to run away with him because he wanted to protect me from my stepfather and all that was taking place in my home at, at the age of 15. And he was 22 at the time. Wow. So I, I, I did this sadly. And while we were on the run, a married elder with three children whom he worked with came and met us and gave him money to keep us on the run. While my mother was frantically um, looking for me. And when we returned, as usual, you know, we had that dreaded elders meeting where they questioned myself the abuser, and three elders in a, a room alone without my parents. And my mother wanted to be there. They would not allow her to be in the room. Right. And they asked all those horrible questions that they ask 
that should never be asked to a teenage girl. That's so right. that the detail, that, the graphic details of, of the encounters. It was traumatizing. And not only that, um, the elder that brought money to the abuser was one of these judging elders that was sitting in the room. And I had, I wanted so much to stand up and say, you hypocrite. So that was a turning point for me to realize that this organization is just like any other religion. Right. Uh, they don't protect, they don't protect people. Another thing that happened when we returned is my mother wanted, she was intent on having him arrested for statutory rape. Mm -hmm. But the elders, they highly discouraged it. They told her no, because he was a baptized brother. <laughs> So then my mother proceeded to ask my biological father to have him arrested, but my father would not do so. Um, he asked me, a pregnant 15-year-old, what I wanted. And, you know, what did I, what did I know? You know? Now, were you pregnant with, the, for, with your abuser? Yes. From your abuser. So mm -hmm. let me just, um, so you're 15-ish, he's 22. He abused you. He asked you to go on the run to protect you from your stepfather. Was your stepfather abusing you? He wasn't abusing me, but he was he was uh, verbally, mentally, and physically abusive in okay. the home. Not particularly to me, but well, physical abuse was toward directed toward my brothers, not so much toward me. But the, it was it was abusive. So you're pregnant by your abuser, and um, okay, so you're with the elders. So as a result. You know, I, I married this man with my father's consent because, you know, at this point, I, I'm, I'm in love with this abuser. So little did I know I was going from the frying pan to the fire. And um, so I feel I just I wasn't protected by this organization. Yeah. Claim that that they claim they love us. I wasn't protected by this elder body. I wasn't protected by my parents, you know. And this man was horrible. I, I was married to him for eight years. He was an alcoholic. He was verbally, mentally, and physically abusive. He also killed animals in mm. front of me. And he was a pedophile. And um, I tried to leave on, on many occasions, but I, I just couldn't. I was a battered woman from the age of 16 to 23. And now I had two small children. And so it was at this time that um, he finally got arrested and he got three to six years. And it was for statutory rape of my 14-year-old babysitter. Your babysitter? 14-year-old babysitter. She was a daughter of a sister in our oh, congregation. But somebody on her end called the authorities. Yes. Thank God. Thank God. You know. I later came to find out he was abusing some of my friends. He abused one of my family members, one of my neighbors, and now my babysitter. And God knows, you know, who else yeah. that I, I didn't know. And you know what? All of this could have been prevented if my mother was permitted to have this reported and have him arrested. That's what I thought. That's what I, I thought. All of this horribleness could have been, it could have been stopped. So I was finally free of him. He was in jail, divorced him. Um, as a result, now I was a single parent, um, age 23, with the five-year-old and a seven-year-old to raise on my own. You, I had had to seven, you had a seven-year-old at the age of 23. 23. Mm -hmm. okay. And I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I just, I did the best that I could. And I, I, have a I know. We all I do. Have you a know. Lot of regrets. I know. I know. We have a lot of regrets, but all we were trying to do was survive, Nancy. That's all we were trying to do. We were children and we were trying to survive and we did the best we could. So we can't we can't have those regrets because we did that to survive. But anyway. So I had to go to work and my mother-in-law, this abuser's mother, she was a Jehovah's Witness. So she, she was offering to step in and to watch my children while I worked, which I accepted because I needed help. But that was a big mistake because two weeks later, um, a, 
I had talked to my children. I said, how are you doing, you know, with your grandma babysitting you? Is everything going okay? And they, they proceeded to tell me that things weren't going well. And someone in the family, a close family member, um, they, he hurt my children. But that's all I want to say regarding that. And, um, and so I was <sighs> beside myself with all of that and um, went to the authorities. They said that, um, you know, this would be a long, drawn-out court case, and do I really want to put my th children through it? I had no support from my mother or any elders as to what to do or how to handle this. And um, I, I did go to the elders. They never spoke to me or my children about any of this, never tried to comfort me or help us in any way. When they finally did, the first scripture they showed me was on gossiping. I was flabbergasted because this did not apply to me. It was not what I needed from them. And um, so I left the, the, the kingdom hall in tears. I was, I was in, hy in hysterics. I disassociated myself soon after because, because of just witnessing more corruption and more hypocrisy again. So I was out for four years at that time. And while I was out, I met and married my husband, Bob. Um, I had returned to the organization in 1991. And eventually we had a son. And um, my husband was not opposed. And I was trying to set a good example for him because I always wanted him to be part of this with me. <laughs> he always told me that he was non-recruitable. <laughs> And now I know why. <laughs> so the worldly guy was the better, the better person. Yes. Yes, he was. He was. And he still is. We're married 31 years. He's still oh, by my side. Wonderful. And he's still supporting me, you know, out of this organization. He's happy I'm out. I said, why, why didn't you help me to get out of it sooner? He goes, cause he, he thought it made me happy. And, um, so he just went along with it till it didn't make me happy anymore, <laughs> you know. Um, so I just have to say that my many, a lot of years within the organization was pretty uneventful. You know, it was quiet. My husband used to go to a lot of the meetings with me. He used to comment. Wow. He, yeah, in his comments, he used to say from a worldly point of view. <laughs> you know? uh, so everybody got a kick out of his comments because he was so honest. Oh, you know? what a great guy. Yeah, he still, there was something about it he didn't want any part of um so then in, in 2004 to 2017 i started regular pioneer as i said i wanted to set a good example for him as a wife and i wanted him to see the importance of you know the ministry and well you were being a good witness because that's what yeah. they tell you yeah. and so you went back at around 1991 and you stayed until 2017 wow yikes okay all right. Uh, <laughs> no, I can't believe it either. Well, on, on, um, I'll never forget this. On July 4th, 2017, I was deleted as a pioneer. <laughs> and the reason being the elders told me was I needed a break from pioneer. Um, I, I did not understand this. All I ever heard was, you know, we're at the end of the end of the end and we needed to do more, do more, do more. And, um, and that's what I was doing. So I, I just couldn't understand it. Um, but then when I think back on how this came about and why this came about, a year prior to my deletion, I had heard about the Australia Royal Commission, my mother and I. So we watched the whole thing. Yeah, I watched the whole thing too. How did you hear about it? I you heard a witness. I heard it through another witness family. And we were discussing it on vacation. So when I, we got home from vacation, we watched it, my mother and I. And I was quite happy because I thought, you know, maybe the organization was really going to look into these cases of abuse and really do something and change their policies and procedures. Yeah. And you know what I did so crazily? I called up the branch and I asked to speak to the legal department. And I proceeded to tell them my story, what I'm telling you now. And how thankful I am that Brother Jeffrey Jackson is looking into all of this, right? Oh, wow. And yes. that he's going to actually, you know, 
do something. I, it gave me hope. Yeah. You know? Wow. Wow. And, but what I didn't realize is that this actually put a mark on my back. So, mm-hmm. Because I had told him my name, my number. I told him the congregation I was in. I said, if you ever need any, need to me, answer me any questions regarding the abuse, please, you know, I'm happy to, you know, tell you anything you need to know. And, you know, but it was all, it was all for nothing because I knew too much and they knew I knew too much and I was a loose cannon. So they just wanted me, they just wanted me out, (coughs) you know. And you know, Nancy, I just recapped the study article 35 for this week. (coughs) We're filming this on October the, what is this, 28th? October 28th, 2022, the study article recap that's going to be studied this weekend says that to support and comfort and gather around those weak in the faith, you know, so here you are, you're like, oh, not not necessarily saying that you're weak in the faith, but to a Jehovah's Witness, that would be weak in the faith, recognizing that there's a problem in God's only organization. And um, in the study article recap, I said, comfort those weak in the faith you mean don't they mark them don't or weren't we told to mark them and here you're saying that it placed a mark on your back no kidding Mm -hmm. yep that's that's what happened and my my son at the time was a ministerial servant and i i was trying to get answers from him a baptized brother like why this would be happening to me and he said mom they just wanted you out I said, they want me out. Why would they want me out? He said, they got you out on technicalities. I'm like, this, this, I was, I was dumbfounded when I heard this on technicalities. And he seemed to be quite okay with, with that. And I just, I was beside myself as to all of this. I I wasn't woken up yet though. Um, so you were just an innocent, indoctrinated Jehovah's Witness out of the sincerity of your heart, calling the branch, the legal department, saying, I'm just so proud of Brother Jackson, and he's going to take care of this. And they were like, oh, we have to get rid of this crazy woman, right? Exactly. That is exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. So with my deletion, I... um. I packed up and left. I was going back to my home congregation because this congregation that I was in, this was actually the congregation where all my abuse started. The original congregation. I don't know if I could say the name of the congregation. Do what you want. Okay, it was the Carbondale Carbondale Congregation of Pennsylvania. And so I, I went back to that congregation to help in the ministry, and I was deleted in that congregation. So I decided to go back to my former congregation where my daughter and, hus- and her husband and grandchildren were at. Okay, hold on a minute. So you get deleted out of a congregation. What does that mean? And, and you go, and then you, you go to a different congregation. What does that mean? I've, I've not heard that term. They didn't have that when I was in. You well, just- no, they, de- they deleted me as a pioneer. Oh, so, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I voluntarily left because the reason I went to that congregation was to help in the territory because I was a pioneer. It was suggested through the JW broadcast okay. that, you know, if you wanted to go help where the need was great, wow. you, go, you know, so I did that. And I thought, oh, God, this is my congregation when I was a teenager. I know that area. I'll go back and help out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They really did get rid of you, didn't they? Yes, they did. So, yeah, I went back to my original congregation, uh, the Mount Cobb congregation of Pennsylvania, where my daughter and her husband and my granddaughters were. And while I was there, um, it came to my attention, this is another horrifying story, um, that a married elder who was a father of one was sexually abusing and assaulted um, five sisters in a Bible study. And the sisters, sisters and a Bible study and a Bible study. Mm-hmm. How did you hear about this through the gossip mill? No, it was in service. I was doing letter writing with the sister, and she confided with me and another sister what had happened to her. And I said, "Oh my oh. goodness, this happened to another sister that we all knew." And we just all started putting two to two together and realized that more people were involved, and they were just too afraid to come forward. Wow. But I was not. And I, I've had and seen just about enough. So I reported it to the elders. 
to awesome. my coordinator and to another elder. You know, and, and it was on Halloween of 2019, Halloween night, Good. I'll never forget it, to expose this evil. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so this, it didn't go well. This elder um, in question, he stepped down, but he was not punished for this abuse. It was, you know, disregarded. He didn't do it. He didn't admit to it. Totally denied it, actually. He continued to have the same privileges as an approved publisher would have. He even prayed for the congregation and gave talks. And we had to listen to this. And we were sick, sick to our stomachs. And then there was marking talks. There was local needs talks um, given on mental illness, malicious liars, gossipers. Um, so they made a sound. They made. They wanted to make the congregate make it known to the congregation that we were the liars and he was not. They're such cowards, you know. Oh. They are such cowards. And one of the abused sisters, she actually wrote a letter to the circuit overseer, a new one that was coming to our congregation. She got no no response from her complaint. He did absolutely nothing for us. Nothing. So then I, I decided I was going to write to the branch and I included a copy of this sister's letter that her, her, I got her permission. The branch, they responded as they always do it with a generic letter saying, you know, that they're going to allow these local congregation to handle this, <laughs> you know? Okay. So I was shunned, you know, um, my daughter and her family were also shunned because of me. They were totally upset. They ended up leaving that congregation and going to another congregation. Now, did they make an announcement or that you were just marked? Um, no, they just, they made, they, they gave a marking tech, but it was very clear that it was about me. Really? Mm -hmm. And I was, I was devastated. Um, I ended up, I had to change house because of the ostracizing. But at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, Jehovah, do you, do you want me to stay here and, and deal with this? Like, I didn't know what he wanted me to do. I kept praying and praying about it. But I thought, you know what? This is affecting my mental health. Yeah. And uh, it stressed me out so much to the point that I developed cancer, breast cancer, in 2020. So you develop breast cancer. You're, you're, you're abused. You're under stress. You're confused. Now, are those other sisters and the Bible study, are they still witnesses? Do you know? Um, the Bible study is not. The other four sisters are. Unbelievable. Or five. Five of them. Unbelievable. <coughs> yep. Okay. So then that happened in 2020. And then the pandemic followed right behind um, my surgery. And that's when I actually did all my critical thinking. And then I woke up. I woke up the summer of 2021. Great. Wow. So it's been a little over a year that you've had your own mind. Mm -hmm. You've been able to think for yourself. And you've been able to see the light through the darkness. And what you were involved in. How interesting that your mother started to dabble in the occult. And become a Jehovah's Witness. Thinking that. She was led by God. That's very scary to me now that I really think about it. All right, Nancy. So it's so amazing. You've had all of this happen. You wake up and um, take it from there. Tell me what happened. Well, I was watching the convention in 2022, a still devoted Jehovah's Witness. And, and the talk that Splane gave on apostates, it really got me really upset. Now, wait a minute. Was this this year's convention? No, it was. No, I'm sorry. 2021's. OK, but he made it very clear that people who left the organization and that spoke against it were liars, apostates, people we should, you know, not believe. And um, he's a coward. Very yeah. much a coward and paranoid. And then and the, the whole talk was ridiculous because. It didn't make a bit of sense because at first he's saying, you know, don't do research. And then at the end, he's like, be like the Bereans and, and do what? 
look at their publications only and figure out what, you know? So a light bulb went on with me. I felt him directly speaking to me and calling me a liar. And I just thought to myself, all these people that are speaking out, you know, about abuse are not liars because this happened to me and my family too. And I'm not a liar. Wow. Yeah. So their, I own, pa their own paranoia about apostates Turn, makes it quite evident the liars they are because there's so many people who've been abused in the organization and they can see through it if they could just give themselves the opportunity to think. Yes. So, yeah, I came to the sad realization that this organization did not love or care about me or my children. And that was devastating because I already knew like the local congregations, elders, they didn't care. You know, I, I knew that, but to think the governing body didn't care. Yeah. If the governing body, I was so devoted that if they told me to jump, I would say how high. And I just can't believe that now I'm on the other end of it, but it's. Well, let me ask you, along those lines, what did you think when the November 2013 Watchtower came out saying to obey for life-saving direction, obey them, even if it did not seem practical from a human standpoint? What, did, what were your thoughts at that time as an indoctrinated witness? I thought it was crazy. Okay. I even asked my mother, I said, Mom, this is crazy. I said, I just could not believe it. And she's like, well, Nance, we'll deal with it at the time and don't worry about it now. And I'm like, no, this, this sounds ridiculous to me. I don't, I, I don't like it. Okay. You know, it just sounded crazy then. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after hearing that talk, I wanted to talk about this talk to somebody, but I knew I couldn't because you can't, you can't talk yeah. about this. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I re I recapped that whole convention last year. It nearly drove me crazy. It did. It did. I because see when I recap them, I have to listen to each talk over and over and over and over again. Oh my god! And, uh, I tried to recap the one this summer. I couldn't. I I just I had to make an announcement that I wasn't going to do it. So yeah, I don't blame you. So yeah, I ended up. Um, <laughs> searching the internet and I just typed in spleen and apostates and, and that just opened up the floodgates you know and I, down the rabbit hole I went and everything I heard I checked it out and it was all true nobody was lying about nothing and everything that everyone said I felt the same way I finally I finally felt validated you know um I totally related to everything and I have to say, it, it was devastating, though. You know, well, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. Oh my God, it was devastating to think that everything you believed your whole life was not true. You know, it was it was, it was horrible. I actually started seeing um, a counselor and then a psychologist, and um, just to make sure I was doing okay. And my, I asked my psychologist, I said, "How do you think I'm doing?" And she said, "I said you." I think I'm depressed or anything else. And she said, no, I just think you're a very strong woman and you're just trying to sort out all the damage that was done. So that was comforting to know that, you know. And I just want to say, um, during the same time, I was also listening. I was so devout. I mean, I listened to everything. I take notes on conventions. I mean, I, I was so devoted. Did you ever look back on your convention notes? You know what? No. And I still have them in a box. <laughs> I used to take notes, too, and I never looked back on them. <laughs> That's funny. I have a box of them. And I thought, oh, God, I'll save them for the tribulation. When they take our Bibles, I'll be able to read them. <laughs> really? Was that your thought? That wow. was my thought. Like, Do you, yeah. you have a fire pit out back one night? You and your I don't, but I will have them. I'm going to burn them. Another thing I wanted to mention to you is I had burned all of our literature, bond volumes, everything, because we were moving and we had a circuit overseer that came through and he told us that we needed to get rid of our literature because he said 
the website on it was an old website and that these were not things we should be placing. So, of course, you know, obedient Nancy, I got rid of everything because uh, I just wanted to follow the direction. And yeah, and then come to find out that because of the changing light, you know, they didn't want these things known from these old publications. They're running with their tail tucked between their legs like the cowards they are. Yes. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was listening to all these updates regarding the pandemic, and all I ever heard was, like, pressure from the organization to get this vaccine. Yeah. And personally, I didn't want it because I just recovered from cancer. You know, I have an autoimmune disorder, and it was just something that I wasn't personally comfortable with. And But I just kept hearing, you know, 50% of the Bethelites got it, 80%, 90%, 99%. And it was a pressure to get this. And the reason being, I don't know why, because they never pressured anybody before with vaccines. It was always, you know, your health care decisions are your own personal decision. And you shouldn't be pushing any of it on anyone. And then all of a sudden, they're pushing this on us. And that made me wake up. Um, because what they were alluding to is because you weren't following the governing body's direction, then you're not spiritual. You're not a follower of Christ. You know, and that that was an insult to me because I was. Yeah. So that was that was really eye opening. Um, so tell me. So you get out, did you just fade? Did you um, write a letter of excommunication? Uh, are, are you still, are they still hounding you? What's going on now? Well, I intended on fading because I have, my mother is a Jehovah's Witness. My daughter, her husband, my granddaughters, my son and his wife, my nephew and his wife. I did not want to lose them. And, um, I, I wanted to fade, but I knew I wasn't going to be able to fade if everything opened up and we were going back to meetings, you know, but I was going to try. Um, but in the meantime, I expressed some doubts to my mother and yeah. to another sister and they ran to the elders on me and they turned me in and now the elders wanted to talk to me and um, I did not want to talk to them. First of all, I was going through a family crisis in my own home with my husband, health related. And I did not want to talk to them about the subject because I knew where it would go. Yeah. You know, because um, I'm very open and honest and upfront and I would tell them and I didn't want to tell them. And so, but they insisted, they were texting me, calling me and um, it, it, it didn't stop. And, and because I would not respond to them, they gave another marking talk on me. They gave a marking talk. My son who's a ministerial servant texted me and said, mom, we heard your marketing talk tonight. We really hope that you come back to, to Jehovah and, you know, turn around and whatnot. I'm like, well, what? how, do, how, do they, how did he know it was your marketing talk? That's what I asked him. I said, was there, was there a name given? So here my son knew. He's a ministerial servant. He shouldn't be privy to elder information. And he was given it. And so that was horrible. Do you think they told him that we are this marking talk is for your mother? I do. Yeah. Wow. What's? Oh my God. Okay. Another thing they had him do was they he had a public talk scheduled, and guess what his talk was on loyal. It was on something about loyalty to Jehovah and to the organization, and it was it was to clearly help all of my family see that they need it to cut ties with me. Horrific. That is horrific. So they, they, they absolutely ruined my reputation, yeah. my name, that I have been building a lifetime. Yeah. You know, I know, Nan. In front of my children and my grandchildren. I know. I know. I know. That's their goal. That's their goal. So basically, the goal of the marking talks, the goal of the disfellowshipping and having to come in and sit in the back and all that, it's a public shaming. That's what it's all about. They slandered you to your family and your friends because you overcame their lies. You 
are a fighter. You're not going to sit down and take anything, anything. You saw through the lies of these cowards, Nancy, and they had to get rid of you, but not only that, ruin you in the process. That's what's so sad, but that's not who you are. You can't identify with that. It's look, I mean, I, I, my family hasn't spoken to me. It's been more than 30 years. So I hear you, sister. OK, I hear you. But that's not who I am. And that's not who you are. So I just want to share that with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. What I'd like to know is what's going on with your family members now? What about your friends? Uh, where are you now? Well, now I'm just taking it one day at a time. Mm -hmm. um, I still believe in God. I pray mm -hmm. to him regularly. I try to read the Bible. Um, my family, I did have some supervised visits with my granddaughters because I just couldn't bear being away from them. And my daughter. Supervised visits? Supervised visits. I was allowed to go to her house on two occasions to visit my granddaughters. Um, but very recently, my granddaughter, who's 17, um, she texted me and she basically told me she was getting baptized. And now she's going to make the decision, you know, not. Well, so she was pressured into doing that. And our prayer is for her to wake up as well. You know, it may appear that that was her own decision, but we know it's not. We know the pressure is on. We know what these publications say. It's all about us versus them. She's just trying to save her life. I know. I understand that. I I can continue to hold out hope for all of them. You know, because if I woke up, I right. know that they can too. Right. So you had supervised visits with your grandchildren. Is your son a ministerial servant? Yes, mm -hmm. he is. Mm -hmm. And um, your mother, she's still in? And she's a pioneer. Regular pioneer. Mm -hmm. And how old is your mom? She's 78. Mm -hmm. You know, through all the harassment, I ended up calling the police. Because after that marketing talk, um, it was like the last straw. And so I called the police. They suggested a magistrate. I went to the magistrate. And I filed harassment charges against Good the elders. Good for you. Wow. I was, I've had Good it with for them. you. I've had it. And um, I ended up losing. I lost the hearing, but it was worth it just yeah. to, to do this. And and you know why it was worth it? Because I ended up being able to do research on the court records. And I found out that these three men, elders, they all had recent um, court court records and, and fines attached to these records. One had a DUI. A recent DUI, the coordinator. Another one had criminal mischief and property damage. And the third one, along with his father, <laughs> had fines with a loaded gun being in a vehicle, um, a deer, a deer without a deer tag on it. Oh. And yeah, it, so these were all recent charges against these men who were then about to judge. Um. Yes, in this judicial committee meeting and I just thought to myself I'm not going to this kangaroo court I am going to write a letter of disassociation and I am I'm going to be done with this because I just I just I, I could take I couldn't take anymore so I did that and and that was it they announced my name February 17th of this year okay and um, I've never felt freer Praise God. Yes. You know, I, I say the same thing when I got out. I mean, all the things that I went through were, I got out in the late 80s. I as hard as it was, the loneliness that I experienced because I lost everybody I was born in um, is beyond imagination when literally there is nobody to call, you know, um, but I never looked back once I never said gosh should I have done it should I have and even I had a family mem member elder say 
you know, I could get you back and you won't have to wait. I could pull some strings and you won't have to sit in the back of the kingdom hall for a year. You know, I was like, listen to yourself. Um, so they really did a job on us, didn't they? They really did. But the focus is that we overcame. You conquered them. You went out fighting in spite of the fact of how they tried to ruin you and how they tried to take everybody that you ever knew and loved. And what's important to do is to replace the lies that they told you about yourself because you are worthy of God's love. There's nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with me. Okay? It's them. And we got out. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of my channel is to replace the lies so that because I lived a life of defeat for 20 years after I left the organization, I still felt I was not worthy of God's love. And until I replaced those lies with the truth of scripture that Jesus died for me and that it's through his death and resurrection that I have salvation, I can't work for it. And I started to read the Bible and I replaced all the lies, the fear, the anger, the animosity fled. And now I'm free to be who I am. Are there still wounds? Yes, but less and less. So I'm so happy to hear that, you know, you were able to get out because this is your new beginning now. This is where you begin your life. I'm very happy about that. Yeah, I, I'm i looking forward to it. Have and you, I know I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a process. And, you know, it's almost going to be like a roller coaster. It was like today you're feeling really good. And then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, they took away our family and our friends and our lives. So um, have you made new friends, world, worldly friends? <laughs> Well, I just want to say that I come from a big Italian family, and um, they have been so supportive. Oh, I'm so glad. Welcome me all back, you know, and they're there constantly for me. And my brother, who's been disfellowship for over 30-some years, he graciously accepted me back into his life, and I'm back with him. I'm so thankful that. And, and also, I've been running into XJWs um, that have faded and even just, you know, disfellowship ones. And we have created this bond and friendship now. And now, you know, we continue to support each other. We go out with each other. And um, it's, it's been genuine, wonderful. right? It's yeah. genuine. You know, what I love on the outside is this, when we were on the inside, we used to have to call each other Sister Jones, Sister Smith, Brother Jones. Because we were required to, but now it just comes naturally. I have all of these people calling me, you know, sister. And it's it's a term of endearment. People on the outside are more genuine than when we were all on the inside. Absolutely. Well, any final words, Nancy? Any um, Anything maybe that you missed that you wanted to point out or any encouragement for... For those who are on the inside, I think of maybe a, a Bethelite's wife who might be awake or a Bethelite who might be awake and Pimo and might be watching this. Any final words? Yeah, I just want to say one of my favorite scriptures, as we all know, is John 8, 32, <laughs> where it says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And that, and it has, it's freed me from this organization and it, it's, and we could just see from that scripture that Jesus made it clear that the more truth that we know, the more freedom we experience. That's you know, right. we thought we thought we had the truth. We did no not. Way. No we way. Not. So, yeah, I, I hope this helps other people because the XJW community on YouTube has really helped me immensely, especially your channel. I really related to you and I thank you so much for helping mm -hmm. me yeah. because I find that many of um you know, the XJWs that leave, they, they don't have any faith anymore. They're, they're either atheist, agnostic. 
And it saddens me that they've, they've totally lost it, you know, but you and your channel, you know, I relate it to because I haven't lost that. And I, I want to continue that. I don't have a church to go to, but I don't want a church to go to. Yeah. Because right. I don't trust any of them. I know. Yep. I'm I know. done with that, you know. I so. know. Well, the trauma of what the organization did to so many has turned them against God. But we listen, we were not serving God. That was not that God of that organization is not the God of the Bible. Give him a chance. Find out who he is. He has a better hope than we ever had. We never had any hope. So anyway, Nancy, I wish you the best. And I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I wish I could meet you someday. I think we could be friends. I'd love to sit with a cup of coffee and just chat with you. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> Hopefully someday, maybe. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Nancy. And I hope to keep in touch with you. All right. Thanks so much, Elaine, for this opportunity. You take care.